Hi everyone, I'm Colleen Fitzwater, Communications Director for the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance. Today I'm speaking to Dr. Otto Metzger. Otto is the breast cancer oncologist and clinical investigator with Boston's Breast Oncology Center at Dana-Farber, Brigham and Women's Cancer Center, and a member of our Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance Scientific Advisory Board. Hi Otto, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, thanks for having me. So first, can you tell us briefly about your background and what made you interested in lobular breast cancer? Okay, that's a, that's a good question and a nice start. So I'm originally from Brazil and did all my training there. And many years ago, during this training, during my oncology training, I got fascinated about breast oncology because at that time, uh, we're learning a lot about the disease biology. And we're trying to understand how breast cancer can be subdivided into subtypes. And while all this was happening, from a clinical standpoint, I had always been intrigued by lobular carcinoma because this is a special subtype of breast cancer that has always uh, come up with questions in tumor boards sometimes from the way the disease presents, sometimes for those who unfortunately have a relapse, this may be uh, different than ductal. So I was intrigued at that time. And, and so that's how I got into this field. After I finished my training, I decided to specialize in Preston College. I initially moved to uh, Brussels in Belgium, where I did a fellowship uh, in breast cancer research. And at that point, I had the time and I had the resources and mentorship to start investigating and asking questions that were relevant for the fields and really trying to understand the lobular uh, in a different way. Otto, can you tell us how you became involved with the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance? So uh, the founders of the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance, along with Steph Osterreich, which is a colleague and a long-term collaborator at the UPMC in Pittsburgh, when they contacted me to join the group when it was being formed, I was thrilled to participate and to say that I would do whatever that they needed uh, from my side in terms of help, because Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance at that time was being created as a mechanism to increase awareness about the disease, to foster research in the field. So it was really matching with my ambitions from a research standpoint. And it's been a, a pleasure to work with LBCA throughout the years and see how the organization is maturing and, and fulfilling its uh, major objectives as uh, it increases its visibility and has been uh, a major force uh, informing patients about uh, the differences and the similarities between having a diagnosis of lobular versus non-lobular. So you recently presented research findings on mammoprint at the European Breast Cancer Conference. First, can you explain what mammoprint is? Mammoprint is one of the genomic uh, tests that one can use in clinical practice to help clinicians decide about chemotherapy, treatment decision for patients who just had an early stage breast cancer. When I say it's a genomic test, this is different from the genetic assessment that one, that a patient can do to evaluate risk of disease. Here we're talking about measurement of a specific genes in the tumor specimen that was resected. So what type of patient with lobular breast cancer would have this test and when would they have it? So mammoprint is a test that's approved to be used for patients who just had surgery for an early stage breast cancer. And among other tests, mammoprint is one of the tests that can be useful when a clinician is trying to decide about the potential utility potential value for using adjuvant chemotherapy for patients with early stage disease. There's a lot of variation in clinical practices, but basically this is a test that has proven utility in its ability to better uh, define who should benefit from chemo or for whom chemo would not play a role. 
Okay. And what did your study find out regarding patients with ILC? What did you learn? This is a study that I did in collaboration with many co-authors from the MindAct adjuvant study, which was a previously conducted study by the conduct by the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer in Europe, along with investigators uh, at the Breast International Group. So the principal investigator of this study is Fatima Cardozo, who was very uh, kind in letting me work with the MindAct group with her on this proposal. And our main idea there was really try to investigate in the subset of patients who were diagnosed with lobular carcinoma and were enrolled in this study, what was the clinical utility of this test, Memaprint? So uh, in the Mind Act original publication, we knew that Memaprint was uh, proven to be a test that's clinically useful in the sense that if someone is diagnosed, if a patient is diagnosed with a clinical high risk early stage breast cancer, where there are indications that this patient might benefit from chemo, if you do a test, like if you do the print test, you can better define and you can better refine your treatment recommendations and say, well, for a big proportion of these patients, in fact, they can be treated without chemotherapy, which is wonderful. So that was the main, the primary end point of the Mind Act trial. So as part of this lobular question, the first important uh, feature that we had on Mind Act is the fact that all the tumor samples from thousands of patients that were enrolled in the Mind Act trial, they were centrally revealed by a, a pathologist uh, in Milan, Giuseppe Viali, who is an expert in the field. So basically on Mind Act, we had a certainty about the histological subtype and we knew for sure which patients were lobular and which were not. And I'll get back to this portion about the central review and how important that became for us uh, in a second. So basically on Mind Act, we had this very valuable resource from a very large clinical trial where we had the genomic name print for all patients and we have the uh, central uh, histological subtype. And our main question was, can we identify a subset of patients with lobular carcinoma that could have a high print score, meaning that if you have a high print score, there, this might be an indicator of higher risks of relapse. So uh, in collaboration with statisticians in Europe, and the main statistician is uh, Kohali Ponce, we're able to demonstrate that in the subset of patients classified or diagnosed with lobular carcinoma with a high print score, they had a similar outcome to those patients classified as or diagnosed with adult carcinoma and high print score. So basically, uh, this uh, analysis has a lot of implications. In many countries outside the US where genomic tests like Memaprint are not approved, sometimes clinicians, when they see, when they're treating a patient diagnosed with lobular carcinoma, sometimes they say, well, this is lobular carcinoma, this is not a subtype where chemotherapy should play a role. And they basically, they don't try to uh, do a genomic test or they don't have the resources to do a genomic test and they're not able to identify the small subgroup of patients classified that could be classified as high uh, genomic risk. So uh, this is uh, an important message. So the main important message from this trial is that for patients with lobular carcinoma, we should al always try to identify which is the small subset of patients that might benefit from, uh, from chemotherapy or who might have high risk features or high risk genomic features, which could be an indirect indicator for chemotherapy treatment benefit. So when I say that a small subgroup is because uh, when we looked at the results from Mind Act, and here just looking, just focusing in the subset of patients classified as lobular by central review, about 
16% of these patients were classified as high risk by mammograms. So it's the minority, minority of patients diagnosed with lobular that have these high risk features, which makes it a little bit more difficult in the clinical practice to try to identify who they are just based on classic pathology. And just going back to this idea, this notion that we had the central pathology review, we're able to dig it a little bit further and try to see if that would be different or similar if you had a classic lobular or variants of invasive lobular carcinoma. So this is probably getting too many details and pathology is not uh, an easy field and it's not so easy to translate to patients, but uh, lobular carcinoma doesn't come as a, just a single diagnosis and a good pathologist should be able to tell about variants of lobular. So the most common variant or subtype of lobular is the real, the classic lobular carcinoma. It's the one that we see more often, but there are some other, other subtypes that are not so common and there are many, we call it, let's put it this way, they are variants of lobular. And in the MindAct trial, the lobular subset classified as classic lobulars, the lobulars that we know as lobulars. So about 10% had the high print score. And when you look into the variants, this was much higher. 23% of these patients, they had a high mammogram print score. So it's interesting to see that we're not able to identify or report on the frequency of a genomic test in this population, but also learn a bit more about the importance of subdividing or paying special attention to the special subtypes or variants of lobular carcinoma. But to make a long story short, having a high MEMA print score on MindAct implied that these patients had a similar outcome as patients diagnosed with ductal carcinoma and high MEMA print. By contrast, the good news is the great majority of patients with lobular carcinoma, they are classified as low risk by a genomic classifier, MEMA print here, and their outcome was incredibly favorable and similar to the outcome of patients diagnosed with ductal with low MEMA print score. So although we have many limitations in this analysis due to a small number of patients, the data was pretty reassuring in the sense that the clinical outcomes at five years or even with longer follow-up, with a median follow-up of 8.7 years, we can see that these patients, they had a similar outcome to ductal when matched by the print genomic scores, which could be a, a clinically useful information in our clinical practice. What would you say are the implications for ILC treatment itself? So I think there are important implications. The first message for a clinician is to try or to remember that there could be a subset of lobular cases that would be classified as high genomic risk. So if a clinician feels that based on classic variables such as tumor size, nodal status, that this patient could be a candidate for chemotherapy if she had a high genomic risk, the same process of thought should take place for a patient that was diagnosed with lobular carcinoma. And sometimes the challenge is it might be difficult for a clinician to really try to identify who are these patients if you have a pathology report from a classic ILC and you're trying to see if this patient would fall into high risk just based on classic pathology markers. So the message is there might be an advantage in using genomic tests like memoprint while trying to decide what's the best treatment for a patient with early stage ILC in our clinical practices. So we did have um, some LBCA Facebook followers and we asked them if they had any questions for you and they did have some that they wanted to pose to you. So most were related to oncotype versus mammoprint. So my first question for you is, can you explain what oncotype is 
what it's used for, and how that compares to what mammoprin is used for. I love the questions from, uh, from patients because they are usually very good and challenging questions. So uh, Oncotype is a similar genomic test to mammoprin, developed in a slightly different way in the sense that the seminal study that led to the current use of Oncotype called TaylorX was conducted in a slightly different manner. And basically this is a test that's widely used in our clinical practice and helps us with the same notion while we'll trying to identify which patient should benefit or be spared from adjuvant chemotherapy. The comparison of Oncotype to Mamoprint as a head-to-head -head comparison has not been done. One could expect that these tests would perform equally well. So uh, basically we don't have a head-to-head -head comparison. At the EBCC meeting where I presented the data from the MINDAC trial, we saw on the same session the publication or the presentation from a study conducted in Germany, where they did look at the role of Oncotype DX among patients diagnosed with lobular in a separate study. And in their conclusions, which is now uh, published, uh, they say that the value of Oncotype recurrence score might be different in lobular versus non-lobular. The way I interpret this is uh, not as if Oncotype had no value for lobulars. I basically see this as a matter of numbers. We're dealing here with a small proportion of patients that uh, could be reclassified as high risk by Oncotype DX. So your statistical power, your ability to come up with firm conclusions about its utility is not as strong. So I basically, I feel very comfortable in using Oncotype as I do for Mammoprint while trying to get to this question of the chemotherapy benefit for patients diagnosed with lobular. So can you comment then on whether patients with ILC should be thinking about one test versus the other? and under what circumstances? So patients diagnosed with an early stage ILC when chemotherapy is being considered, they should uh, discuss about the utility of a genomic test. I don't think that we have data to say that name print versus oncotype should be used. The data from the MIND Act uh, publication, which I'm involved, uh, it's, it's very interesting, but we also have data from Oncotype. So the message to patients is discussing about a genomic uh, biomarker to help with chemotherapy treatment decision is a wise move. I don't think that's so important to focus on the specific genomic biomarkers and they could go with their clinician uh, method of choice which is highly influenced by the way the healthcare system is structured where a patient is. Sometimes there are issues related to reimbursement, practice. So basically, uh, based on the data that we have at the moment, uh, one could use the test of choice based on these characteristics, based on these things. One patient asked if the Oncotype score was low, would the Mammoprint be low as well? In the most likely scenario, yes. And uh, when you use Mimiprint or Oncotype, you're really trying to identify a uh, tumor characteristic is indicative of uh, low proliferation or favorable features from a genomic standpoint. So these tests, they were not never compared in larger studies, in big prospective studies head to head, but we would expect a fair amount of overlap. And the message in the clinical practice and for patients is, if you have a test done, there is no reason to repeat and do another one. Another woman had the Oncotype test, which evaluated her at low risk, and so she didn't have chemo. She wondered, if the mammoprint tests 70 genes and Oncotype tests 21, is it still the case that a decision for whether or not to have chemo 
can be based on oncotype scores. Yes, so if someone had uh, an early stage invasive globular carcinoma and had an oncotype recurrence score indicating no chemotherapy benefit or recurrence score within the low intermediate score, there is no reason for this patient to ask for another test like Nemoprint. We can rely on a low recurrence score for patients with lobular as we do for a, a low risk by Nemoprint. So again, there is no need to repeat a, a test if this was already done. And based on some uh, exist, existing data, there is a fair amount of overlap between these tests. And although when you look at oncotype and the MIMA print, although the number of genes is different, one test is not necessarily better than the other. And it's totally okay to follow your oncologist, your clinician recommendation and, and, and be happy with the result that's available at the moment. Does the recommendation about when to have one or both tests change for those diagnosed at later stages, because this is a significant portion of the lobular breast cancer population at diagnosis, given that ILC is often missed on scans and diagnosed at a later stage. This is a very good question. And just to rephrase it quickly, if you have a diagnosis that's more advanced rather than earlier, let's imagine if someone is diagnosed with a node positive disease as opposed to node negative, and we're talking about lobular carcinoma, and if there would be differences in uh, nematrint versus oncotype. So the correct answer is we don't know. Those were not compared head to head in a clinical study to show that one would be better than another. But we know that the MIMA print uh, test was prospectively validated in the MINDACT trial, which is a study that did include patients with node positive disease. So the results that were presented on the MINDACT study for the lobular subset do take that into consideration and include patients with node positive. By contrast, the uh, data that exists from the prospective study evaluating oncotype DX, which is the Taylor Rex study. This is a trial that did not include node positive patients. But at the same time, we have lots of retrospective data and series published showing that oncotype DX is also a valid test for patients with node positive disease. So one could go either way. But if someone is more strict and want to go by level one evidence, and while we have a study ongoing looking at the value of oncotype for patients with known positive disease, while this is not yet presented and published, we can say for sure that the data from MindAct did include these patients. As a clinician, I don't think that this should make a difference. And although the data for uh, memoprint in the MindAct lobular looks quite nice. I, I would say that the value of oncotype should not be reduced. And I think there is space for using both tests in our clinical practice. And again, the message that's more important here, it's not the test itself. It's more about testing the correct patients and trying to identify this is a small subset of patients who might have characteristics indicative of a potential chemotherapy benefit. Great. So do you have any parting words as we wrap this up for patients with ILC about these two tests? Yes, uh, I would say that for patients diagnosed with ILC, first of all, this is a disease in the great majority of cases where the most important treatment is an optimal adjuvant hormonal therapy. Invasive globular carcinoma is the prototype of a disease that's driven by estrogen. So the hormonal therapies, which are 
designed and are able to block the action of estrogen, these are the therapies that are going to have a real impact, long-term impact. When we're talking about chemotherapy for patients diagnosed with early stage disease, the main goal here for patients with lobular is really to try to identify a small subset of patients who potentially could benefit from chemotherapy on top of hormonal therapy. The data from the MIND Act study did show that a proportion of these patients up to 16% of patients with lobular can be classified as high risk by MEMA print. It does not necessarily tell us that these patients did benefit from chemo because we're limited by numbers there and we'll always be limit, limited by a small number of patients and a small proportion of high risk patients. But it did indicate that the outcome of these patients was similar to patients with high risk ductal classified as high MEMA print. The data uh, is very interesting. And there is another point about MIND Act and this analysis that we didn't talk much about during this conversation is the fact that when a local pathologist classifies a patient as having lobular carcinoma, when we did the central pathology review on MIND Act, uh, using data from a, an expert in the field, uh, Dr. Giuseppe Viali, we could see that a great, uh, a very large discordance between the local and central assessments. So again, I don't think that, that this is so important for our clinical practice because every patient is trying to get the best treatment at each place. And I think this is more of a message for research or when trying to understand the research that has compared lobular to ductal and the importance of paying attention to this central pathology review, which does give us more information and certainty about the results that we're talking about. Thank you, Otto. I really appreciate your um, taking the time today to do this.